If you ask me, behind every failure, when business want to change or transform, there is a common denominator. And that has to do with the way leaders interact with their employees. I have some numbers again. 57% of employees report not being given clear directions. And as much as 69% of managers are not comfortable communicating with their employees in general. And that happened to me too. It seems that at work, there is a natural resistance for change that is embedded in our brains. And very often, these interactions that we have with people are often misunderstood. Today, I have invited somebody that has spent his adult life to study the science of communication, Richard Newman, and we are going to be discussing about the science of storytelling and how it can inspire change at work. Let me tell you a little bit more about Richard. So first of all, he comes from a, a country that is very sunny, England. <laughs> That's number one. And more than that, it's about a little bit of his story because I, I, I love stories. I, I like people who has lived a little bit uh, more than the usual. So at the age of 18, he decided to go and discover, uh, discover the world. He has been in the Himalayas and trying to interact with people with Tibetan monks who hardly spoke any English. So, and I think that sparked a little bit the idea of uh, studying or understanding how to communicate non-verbally, because when you don't have the possibility to communicate with the la right language or with the, your own language, then you have to use something else. So Richard has uh, spent a lot of his life researching on non-verbal communication, he has been even been published in the Journal of Psychology. Uh, one of his studies, by the way, has proved that you can increase your leadership ratings by 44% and even win 59% more votes in an election by changing some kind of simple behaviors. And that is quite interesting. He's also the founder of Body Talk. Body Talk is, is a science-based training on the psych psychology of communication. He has written a couple of books, but I just have to highlight a couple that one of them is already quite well known. It, it was called, it is called You Were Born to Speak. And the one that everybody is expecting is the one called Lift Your Impact. Transform your mindset, influence, and future to elevate your work, team, and life, which will be released by the 2nd of May. Uh, and he's talking about groundbreaking communication techniques to help professionals increase their impact and influence. Richard, thank you very much for having the time for me. And really, I really appreciate it. I want to start with a simple, simple question. And it has to do because I found your background, the things that you have done in life, quite interesting. So what is the thing that motivated you to start digging more about the science of communication. There should be some specific type of personal story behind that I, I would love if you can share it with me. Sure, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, so for me, my, my passion around communication started very, very young. Uh, so when I was four years old, I was going to like a sort of kindergarten uh, type school and uh, apparently was enjoying life and getting on well with people. And then just before my fifth birthday, we moved house uh, to a completely different area. And I went to this, this new school. And on the first day, I just remember uh, being, you know, those sort of tiny chairs and tiny tables that you have in those little schools. And I was sitting there and I was trying to interact with these new kids on one side of me and they just weren't interested. They turned their back on me and were laughing. And then I tried to interact with the other kids on the other side. And again, they turned away. I tried to sort of speak across the table to some other kids and they sort of giggled and just talked amongst themselves. And I suddenly felt completely alone. I, I sort of felt like I was in a glass bubble, unable to connect with anybody and felt really emotional, really upset by it. And you know, as a five-year-old child might do in that situation, I just burst into tears. And the, the teacher was trying to console me. And I thought, you know, I really, I want to connect. I want to interact with other people. And I don't really know why I can't seem to do what other people are doing. 
it would be another 40 years before I was diagnosed with being autistic. I didn't know that was the situation. I just knew back then I was, I was challenged with communication. And so sort of through my upbringing, through uh, being at school, certainly into my teenage years, I could see that other people were able to do sort of banter back and forth and build communication relationships and connections in a way that I wasn't able to. I just didn't know what it was. And then around the age of 16, a friend of mine gave me a book on body language. And she said, I think you really need to, to look at this. You should learn about it. And I was amazed by, by, by what I learned. I thought this is fascinating. It was like in the Holy Grail, just thinking, wow, like, does everybody else know this? I didn't know any of this stuff and loved it. And I was putting it into action. And suddenly I was able to improve my communication. I was able to read people more. I was able to adapt myself more. And then around the age of 17, uh, a friend of mine, he wanted to go to Oxford University and he's a brilliant guy. I, I love him to pieces and he's so brilliant. He's so studious. He was one of the most intelligent, if not the most intelligent person at our school. And he was rejected from going there for, for various reasons. But one of the reasons was around his communication skills. And it was that moment where I suddenly thought, OK, I have to really get serious about communication because a, very good friend of mine here has been rejected from one of his greatest life's dreams by not being able to do well in communication. And I thought I'll never be as intelligent as him. I'll never be as well read as him, um, but I can work on my communication skills. And so that's where I decided this is going to be my life's mission. This is what I'm going to work on. And that's why I then committed to going to live in the foothills of the Himalayas in this little Tibetan monastery for six months with a group of people who didn't speak any English, having to learn how to use nonverbal communication to connect, to communicate, to get through the day, to teach them. And I, I was just fascinated by the fact that by the end of the six months of being with them, that I was then able to speak Nepali pretty well, which was the local language <laughs> of the area that I was in. And I could speak it better than French or German that I'd studied for six years at school. And they had learned how to speak English uh, with me. And so I came back to the UK and then I decided I would study acting for three years at a brilliant London acting school where we learned about storytelling. And that was really my introduction to storytelling, how you sit, how you stand, how you breathe, how you move, how you tell a story, how you connect with other people to engage the other actors on, on stage and also engage the entire audience and immerse them in a story. And I've been applying it into business ever since. Uh, Richard, so what I want to know is what was the driver? The driver was it to move from a, a state that where emotionally you weren't comfortable, the one where it, feeling lonely, or was it something else like you said, oh, there is, I don't know, some business to do here, or was it my something that it was really interesting intellectually? So mm. out of the, the three, have I got right at least one of them <laughs> so for, for me the uh, the goal was always to have a voice that was that was always it where i would you know even if i went out with friends family members i'd see them like connecting and interacting back and forth and i'd try and i it's, I, I think of this like trying to get on the on ramp to sort of get onto uh, a road of busy traffic and you know just imagine cars going past at 100 miles per hour and there's all this traffic that's what like a, a conversation can feel like to me i'm there on the on-ramp just trying to get into the traffic trying to get on the road trying to get started and i thought i just don't know a way in to this conversation and therefore i would often sit at social events thinking i've got things to share i've got valuable ideas i've got things that i want to to say here but i just don't feel like i have a voice and so initially for me, it was about that, that opportunity to speak and be heard and have my voice listened to uh, and to be able to engage people in some way. And once I then figured out how to do that for myself, I felt totally compelled to do that for other people because I thought there must be other people like me who just struggle to feel like they've got a voice. And that's really where I focused the last couple of decades is helping people around the world who you know, in the workplace, for whatever reason, they feel like they get ignored, they're talked over, they get dismissed, uh, they've got great ideas, and then they hear other people taking credit for their ideas, mm -hmm. they can see other people getting promoted, who just seem to sort of speak louder and be able to influence people in a way they can't. So, you know, I often say to people, like your CV doesn't get you the job, your CV might get you into the interview, but your communication skills will get you the job. So I want to make sure that everybody has that opportunity that I was able to find for myself to have a voice. 
uh, to be heard and to get the, the respect and the, and the reactions from people that you really deserve. That's always been the driving force for me. Huh. You, you claim that, uh, that we are all born to speak. Yeah. Nevertheless, I would say that for, in a, when you go to a standard office, you will find like probably 60% of people who are in that situation where they don't know how to express it. And even when they are quite familiar to do a presentation in Power, or with PowerPoint, you know, these little moments where there is one-to-one -one interactions as you want to speak up and you want to defend your ideas with your boss, with peers, uh, you don't feel that confident. And, and I, I'm, mm. I'm relating completely to that, that situation. I, I was good at doing presentations for many people uh, in front of PowerPoint, but when I had to defend my own beliefs, I was a little bit weak. So mm. for you, what is the thing that, uh, that makes people who have challenges to empathize, to inspire the, uh, the, the teams? What, are the, what, are, what is the thing that they, they need to work on first? Mm. Yes. Yeah, so so let, let's look at this uh, from because you mentioned there, like, are we are we born to speak or not? So uh, this is something that was clarified for me in an early learning specialist. So this is a lady who was working with children in the range of sort of four to seven. And she said that what her team had found and, you know, they're working with schools uh, all around the country. Uh, she said that 90 percent of people will communicate proficiently and there's no real challenge there for them uh, then two and a half percent of them will have a permanent challenge such as permanent hearing loss and then she said the other seven and a half percent will have a challenge that they can work through and build through and she and I worked out that I was really in that seven and a half percent and that's what had made me so passionate about figuring this out now as for the 90 percent that sort of start off with you know, no real sort of evident challenge. It doesn't mean that they don't have any challenge later on. So like you said, you can get into the workplace and find there'd be a good 60%, I'd certainly say even more than that, uh, of people who in one situation or another, whether it's public speaking or you know, just sort of speaking to their team, using a webcam or having a one-to-one -one interaction, there is an area there that they are struggling with. And um, the principle that I share with people around you were born to speak is actually that, you know, when, when I work with clients, it's not about giving them something they don't already have. It's switching on something they haven't used in a long time. Uh, so I'll, I'll give an example on this. Like there, there was a guy who I worked with who he never moved his hands ever. He would usually like when I was working with him on sort of how he'd interact in meetings, he just kept his hands uh, under the desk and often was sitting on them. And so once we sort of worked on things like, you know, eye contact, tone of voice and so on, I said, you know, what's the situation with your hands? You don't seem to ever gesture. And he said, oh, no, I was told 20 years ago that I was just flailing my arms around and I should do less gestures. So since then, I've just sat on my hands. Uh, and I said to him, look, you know, there's great science on this um, coming out of the University of Chicago. Susan Golden Meadow did this research that showed the, your, your, your hands, they have so many nerve endings that connect from your hands to your brain that when you use, use your hands while you're speaking, you speed up cognitive processing and mm -hmm. you give more intelligent answers and you're much more likely to have, you know, a good and thorough response. And so we worked on like bringing this back to life. And his answer after I did, gave him coaching was, you just gave me back my arms. And I love how he phrased that. Like I wasn't giving him something he never had. What I was doing though, was taking this, what might've been seen before as flailing his arms around and giving him just a little bit of structure around it of certain inborn signals that people might have around uh, their body language that they can then reconnect with. The same goes with empathy. Like you mentioned there, empathy. How do we work on that piece? That you know, people have, um, there's a very small percentage that don't, but almost everybody has mirror neurons in the mind, being yeah. that if you see somebody smiling, the mirror neurons in your mind uh, react with this sensation of smiling so you can feel a smile when you see one. And so we have that empathy. But what we then build up as we go into work is like armor and habits and barriers, because what happened is when we were a teenager, uh, you know, we, we were teased or ridiculed for sh sharing our emotions, or maybe, you know, when somebody was early in their career, they really expressed themselves, they were passionate and they got cut down and told, you know, what you're doing is no good. And so they started to build up some armor and protection in those situations to protect their emotions, which means that later on in life, you can find that people uh, have so much armor weighing them down that they don't seem to really have 
empathy in those situations. It's not that they don't have empathy, they have the instincts for it. They just haven't tapped into them for a long time. So in those situations, it's about just pulling down the armor for a moment and getting to that point where you are okay with being vulnerable, uh, such that the point that you can allow yourself to empathize with others and you can move the interaction forwards. And it can be a huge relief for people to just sort of set that armor aside and allow themselves to be human again, to connect um, with those around them at work and also in their family life. So what I understand from what, what you said is that it's almost like there is three steps in order to start changing to become a little bit a better communicator uh, at work. Like I understood that first of all, you, you need to have like willingness. So this mindset that, that I, I really want to change from this current situation. Um, the second one is about having the capacity. That means that, yes, as you say, we are empathetic like at home, but we don't put it in practice uh, at work for different reasons. It can be like the armor thing. It can be also when you are overstressed, how the hell are you going to have empathy with someone? Uh, and the third thing that I, I, I capture is about this, this story about routines. Uh, is, is that correct? So we need to create these routines in order to start the practice. You cannot, like, from one day to the other, just watch a five minutes video or even read the book of Richard Newman and become a better practitioner of, of, of storytelling or, or communication. You need to start to doing something. Yeah, exactly. Actually, I, I, we mentioned this before. I've captured exactly that in this new book, my, my new baby, Lift Your Impact, uh, which is that idea of routines, uh, because it, it's so true. It's, it's funny sometimes that I get asked to come and work as a keynote speaker at a conference hmm. where I'll be asked to, uh, people will say, could you come in and speak for 25 minutes and completely transform the way our company uh, communicates for the next few years? Uh, in that they'll be great storytellers, empathizers, they'll have amazing body language, and we'll have a new culture of communication. And I'll say to them, well, no, uh, I can I can tell you some inspiring ideas, like I could do a TED talk and I can inspire you. But will that truly change what they do every single day? No, because of routines. So, um, so often when I coach people on communication skills, they say, well, hang on a second, I can't change the way I communicate because this is who I am. And when I say, well, what, what do you mean this is who you are? They say, well, well I, I only gesture like that. And I, I only ever make facial expressions like this. This is who I am. And I say to them, so you're telling me that from the moment that you were born up until today, you've only ever done that gesture and that facial expression. This is who you are. And they say, well, well no, well, okay. Well, not when I was younger, you know, maybe I had more expression and so on, but this is who I've become. And I'll say to them, you are stuck in a routine. There is a routine that you have developed that has led you down this path of how you communicate right now and that routine is going to keep giving you the same results you want right now so the question you need to ask yourself is do you want to keep on getting the same or less results that you're getting right now forever or do you want different results because if you want the same results just stick with your routine if you want different results you have to change the routine and the routine could be how you routinely interact with other people how you routinely uh, approach writing an email how you routinely approach uh, constructing a, a PowerPoint presentation. You've got to shift those routines to the point at which a new version becomes the new way that you do it, where you go, oh, hang on a second, this is who I am. I'm able to do it this way and this way. You've got this new routine rhythm such that when you're in a high pressure situation, it feels like routine. You just think, I just, I just do things this way and now I have these skills that feel like they are me. I'm not putting on anything. I'm just doing things that feel like routine. A bit like, like when I was learning tennis, uh, I love tennis. It's the only sport that I've ever been mildly good at. And, uh, you know, when I learned how to do like a forehand, you didn't just, you didn't just hear like a 20 minute talk from your coach saying, this is a forehand and go, well, that's amazing. I can now win Wimbledon. Like you didn't do that. Instead, you then had to build in a routine. And I would be in the car park at the, uh, the tennis club where when I'm waiting for my parents to come and collect me, I would just be hitting a thousand forehands and they had like a, a line drawn on the wall or painted on the wall uh, of the same height of a, of a tennis net and I hit a thousand forehands until hitting it became routine and then you go into a match and someone hits a ball over there and you just do it without thinking and then you have to make sure that the backhand is routine and the, and the serve and the volley until you can go into a match and it's all routine. Uh, and so, yeah, changing those routines, making the skills that you need for success become routine is really a huge key. And it does take time. It takes commitment to those routines. What is crazy is that we believe that our natural self 
is the one that we are today. But in reality, we, we have been dictated our set of beliefs. Some people will tell you, oh, you suck at communicating, so drop it. Or some people will tell you, oh, you suck at math, then don't become a scientist. So, and, and these are, have become like a set of rules or norms that we live in. So our map, our vision of the world is just limited by what we know, this type of, I don't know, shapes of Legos, and we don't know mm. how to open up uh, a little bit more. You have mentioned something quite interesting about change, and I, and I wanted to drive it to, to our topic. It is that when you are onboarding people into a cultural change in, in organization, most of the effort needs to be done on removing these people's natural resistance to change. And it's normal. Yeah. We don't yeah. like change. Our biology is dictated, dictated by the fact that we need to protect ourselves from something that is unusual. So it will fire up certain chemicals that will make us hate the, uh, the, any change. Mm. So when we need to do change at, at scale in an organization, what do you think is activated in people's brain when we are a good practitioner of storytelling? Mm. Yeah, so I, I, storytelling is so powerful for creating change. And I, I often go and work with leadership teams where they've got a big change coming and they just don't know how to get people on board with it. And that's when you need the real science behind how you tell a story. And so essentially what a story does, like there's loads of stuff on storytelling. People often uh, talk uh, back to you know, all sorts of work that's been done around the hero's journey, hero with a thousand faces from, uh, from Joseph Campbell. And, you know, there's like the 17 stages of, of, of telling a story. We like to boil it all the way down to make it super simple about what does the science say about how the brain is reacting to a story. And the key bits that people need to know about creating change is that we are all, every human being has an instinct to avoid pain and to gain pleasure. And stories hook us by doing that. In about the, the first 15 minutes of any movie, you can just watch this, you see the, the hero, the protagonist in the ordinary world, and then they realize that if they stay doing what they're doing right now, they're going to face extraordinary pain. They then sense within the first 15 minutes an extraordinary level of pleasure that may be available to them if they start moving in a different direction. You then watch the next hour and a half to see if they manage to make it to this extraordinary level of pressure and avoid the pain. That in essence is how you use storytelling to create change in a culture where people will say, look, I like where I am right now. This is my comfort zone. I know what to do. I know what the system looks like. I know how to do the process. I've been doing it for years and it's always been fine. So why is there a problem right now? Let me just keep doing my rut, my little routine, because this is who I am. And instead what we need to do is to help people understand, and this is like a win-win situation is to say, Look, right now, I understand you're in the ordinary world, which feels like everything's okay. I'm here to let you know that if you keep going in this direction, then ultimately you may only be feeling minimal pain right now, but in six months time, there is a cliff. And if you keep going in this direction at this speed, you are over the cliff. And that's going to affect you. It'll affect your, your friends, your family, your colleagues. It's going to be disastrous for everyone. And you're currently reaching the point of no return where I can't pull you back from that cliff edge. If we look in this new direction, if we decide to take short-term pain for long-term gain, because the short-term pain is the change of uh, having to make a change in your routine. Over here, there is something that is so worthwhile that you are personally going to love because it's going to give you this level of pleasure, this level of uh, tremendous experience in your future. And all you have to do is start moving in this direction. I'm not asking you to do it for the next five years right now. I'm just asking you to do it for one day, just to turn and move in this direction to create that new pattern, that new routine. And that will direct you towards uh, this new future. And so when you set that up in the space of a story, you can do it in 30 seconds, 30 minutes, however you want to do it. It's talking about the current situation, potential future pain that will happen, a greater future and a journey that you take people on to get them there. And once people have got that, you light up the survival mind, the emotional mind and the logical mind. And the person is effectively at the end of that story thinking, OK, what do I do now? And you say, this is what you do right now. And they go. So that's that's how you can use this for you know, really embedding change. So it comes from an internal driver that the person wants to uh, to move towards that new future. What is quite crazy, Richard, is that suddenly when organizations want to do a big change, what they will do is organize a big event. 
where they're going to this all about motivations we are going there we're going to reach this change we are going to implement a full digitalization of uh, in 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 our organization let's invite richard to speak for 20 minutes that uh, they will say <laughs> and then change will happen and obviously the the description of what you have said that is the right way of communicating, so activating the both sides of the brain, so the emotional side and the rational side in order to, to, to onboard the person, to, because what you are trying to do is to kind of do the first job together, because the change, is, change is pain. Um, mm. this, this direction needs a little bit more of effort for a, for a manager, right? Because it, sometimes it needs to be individualized. Sometimes it, the, the reason why you don't accept change might be different than my reason. So yeah. and the, the discussion should be individualized. And that means that the manager has to spend time to understand what is the status of each of his uh, members, team members, and to make the communication a little bit more targeted to understand specifically what is the thing that is mm. the mental barrier for, for, for change. So it, it, yeah. it makes it difficult for managers to, to implement it and then they drop it, right? <laughs> yeah, so what you pointed out there is so critical that the individualization of the story is the critical point. That's mm. the piece that everybody needs to get right because it's so true that when people want to have a change, what they do is they set a vision for the future, which is great for the organization. So leadership get together and they say, here's where we want to go. We want to go off over here such that in 10 years, we have five times the amount of profit and 10 times the amount of clients or something like that. And the individual who's sitting there who has to help them get there will sit there and go, okay, you want to go there. Yeah. I don't want to go there. I want to stay what I'm what I'm doing right now. I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing right now. If you want to go there, good luck. Like you can kind of carry me there if you feel like it, but I'm quite happy right here. And so the story always has to be individualized and great leaders. What I like to teach people and ideally what we get to do and with some clients that they've been working with us a while, they know that this is what they have to do. They bring the leaders together and they work with us and they work with my team and they say, okay, we've got this change that needs to happen. It could be a change in their values, a change in their vision, a change in the mission for this year, uh, you know, a change in their employer you know, value proposition. It could be anything like that. And they'll say to us, could you come and help us understand the story of this so that when we share it with people, we can uh, create something that is individualized. And so we share with them, look, the story, the way you tell this story is different for every person. It's different for every department because it means something different. The end goal is the goal. Like there's, there's no change around that, but what it means to different people needs to change. And one of the, the quickest ways to change this is to understand your team's values. So there could be a team's value and there could be a personal value as well. So the simplest way for me to explain this is to say, you know, everybody's been in the situation at some point where you say to somebody, look, we need to do this right now. It's good, you know, based on money and based on time, this is a good idea. It's gonna save us money, it'll make us time. Uh, so it's a good idea. And the person says, I'm not gonna do it. And you might say to them, what, what do you mean? It's, it's like, it's gonna make you money, it'll save you time. Why wouldn't you do it? And the reason being, it doesn't align with a person's values and everybody's values are different. And values are the things that we care about that are not money and time. And sometimes leaders say, well, you know, that values is a bit wishy-washy. No, values is the core that is driving every human being's behavior. We yeah. all care about something more than we care about money or time. You know, if you said to someone, would you like to get um, $10 million tomorrow? And they said, sure. Okay, but to do it, you would have to uh, say that um, you're going to cut off the arm of someone that you love and you're going to break into a bank and you'll have a criminal record. Well, okay, I'm not going to do it. So they care about something more than they care about the money and the time it will take to get them. We have values that are driving us more than money and time. And you have to understand if you want to motivate someone to change so that you, the, the culture changes or people change in their action towards a different vision, you need to know what their values are that drive them every day to have chosen to show up to your organization, to have chosen to be on your team and committed so far. What is driving them beyond money and time? And then you show them based on that value. If you care about that, if you stay where you are right now, that value is in jeopardy. Because if you stay here, this is where we're going to end up. And then that value isn't going to work. It's, you're going to have to break your value to stay where you are. If you go in this direction, that value is connected to the end goal because of this. And, and it could be, genuinely, it could be, and it's important not to manipulate this. It needs to be a win-win. It could be that somebody has a value that doesn't align with the new end goal. 
And it's better to find that out sooner than later than try and try to sort of drag them along. But most of the time you'll realize if you know what the, what the value is that at stake, you can explain the story in a way that incorporates their value in that new mission. And that's the key to really motivate each person. I love that. Uh, <clears throat> it would be nice, in fact, that most of the people are voicing out their, their concerns and say, oh, I don't agree with this change because of this reason. But the worst is that in an organization, probably th these type of people will shut up and will just be passive resistance, uh, implement like, okay, I, I will go with the flow, but I will not do this extra effort or I will keep on doing whatever I was doing in, in the past without this communication. And, and what is sad is that is the role of the leader to spot this passive resistance, to mm. engage them and onboard them. Because mm. at the end, they might be the majority in, in, uh, in the team. Mm. Yeah, so this is where, uh, you know, great leaders, when it comes down to using storytelling, uh, it should be called really story asking, not storytelling. Uh, and the reason being, like, if you go into a meeting and you just tell people the situation, then they'll feel told and they'll go, OK, if that's what you think, then that's fine. But that's not what I think. So story asking can be much more effective. And so leaders need to think of themselves not as the hero of the story. They might think their organization is a hero. They might think that their products and services are a hero. No, the only hero in a story is the person you're speaking to. They are a hero in their own mind. And what I mean by that is every single person has challenges and every single person has goals. And we are all on a journey away from our challenges towards our goals. That's what every movie is about. If you look at any movie like you know, Harry Potter, his challenge at the beginning is that there's this nasty Lord Voldemort that's trying to you know, kill everybody. And his, his goal towards the end is you know, peace and good, good life in the wizarding world. I'm, I'm abbreviating, but it's seven books. You know, so moving away from challenges, moving away, uh, towards goals. And so you know, the same is true for every story. And it's also true for every human. That's how we translate all the billions of bits of data that are going around us every day. We have challenges that we want to move away from. And we have goals we want to move towards. So the way that you use that as a leader is you do story asking. So you sit somebody in for like, you know, a catch up meeting, hopefully not once a year at the employee review, but you sit them down with regular catch ups and you ask them about their story. And the way that you do that is you say, so, you know, talk to me right now. I'd love to know where are you at right now? Asking about the ordinary world, how are things right now for you? Uh, what are the challenges that you're facing right now? And if nothing changes, what sort of challenges could that lead into? And what, what would you, be your biggest concern right there? And when you ask biggest concern, most or main concern, then you start to hear what the values are. And I say, well, the biggest concern that I have right now is that it's just really impacting my life. I've got these young kids that I want to spend time with. I'm stressed out all the time. They see me being stressed. And you go, okay, I now know what your key values are. It's about you know being that good, caring, um, calm, patient parent. That's that's a key driver. And if I impact that in any way, then you're going to be less engaged with us as an organization. So story asking. Then you then you want to find out from them what what does a great future look like for you. And you can even do an umbrella question, where you say, given that this organization wants to grow to ten times the size in the next five years, and we're doing this, given that that is happening. What is your greatest version of that look like for you? How would you love to be involved in that? What does that look like if we could change anything about it, you know, keeping the end goal the same? What does that look like? Describe that for me. And so they're describing not something that's happening right now. It shouldn't be, well, I think that, you know, we should change the data system. And I think that next Wednesday, no, no, no. This is like more imaginative speak. You can ask them the magic wand question. If you had a magic wand and you were here with us for the journey to that point, what does that look like for you? What, what would be amazing for you? And you don't have to offer everything, but you could say, okay, well, I think, you know, some of those pieces, we could certainly talk about taking some of those and breaking it down into a journey for you. How does that sound? What sort of journey could we start to take on that today that would start to move us forwards? And so again, it's story asking, it's not storytelling. So the key thing for, for leaders is always to understand how the brain reacts to a story such that you know the framework well enough that you don't even need to have one ready. You can just go into a meeting and you can either tell one or you can ask one. And then that's the way that people will come with you. I love this concept of a uh, story asking. <clears throat> when people feel like they are contributing to the solution to the change, the resistance reduced drastically. 
Yeah. So yeah. if I'm able to contribute to the goal and somebody asks me my opinion, me, little one in the in the middle of the accounting department, then it's something that is going definitely build bones and break a little bit the, the this um this cycle of, of of being with a lot of uncertainty where everything depends on somebody else. And that's one of the biggest flows that there is in any transformation that it starts from the top. The, the boss saying so this is the direction we uh, we are taking and this is the type of tools that we are going to to use in in order to to change this organization without asking the rest of the people and obviously mm -hmm. the the automatic answer the reflex answer as human beings is going to be i don't want that mm. that would be hey, by the way richard you are using the magic one i want to use the magic one with you okay um so and my next question is about, let's imagine that you get a magic wand and you become the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Hmm. What would be your first actions to make the leaders unleash this power of communication to inspire the teams? Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, I think that in that situation where you've got a you know, vast team of people, uh, it, it's critical, first of all, that you've it sort of depends on which company that you're going to be in. But if, you, if you're going to give everybody this tool of communication, I think that what we've learned over the last couple of years is that people are really feeling a lack of, people are feeling a lack of engagement, a lack of sense of sort of meaning and purpose. There's so many people over the last few years that have resigned. We had this great resignation of people leaving and then not, not coming back to the workforce. A lot of people suddenly deciding to start their own business, do their own thing. And there's so many people now as well who are refusing to go back into the office where they, they've been working from home for a long time. They're productive. They don't really want to go in. And so it becomes harder as a leader to sort of navigate. Well, how do I connect with people? How do I build this up? What I also noticed, you know, having taught communication now for two decades in companies is that uh, a big shift that happened is when people did start to go back into the office, it was stilted. It was a little bit like if you imagine, you know, driving a stick shift car uh, for, for 20 years and then you don't do it for two years but, and you get back in one and you suddenly try and do it. You think I have how did I what is a clutch? I don't really understand. How do I do this thing? In fact, I had that experience recently. I was with friends of mine in, in Canada. I've driven an automatic car for about 15 years because I just got bored of changing gears. And then they had this amazing uh, Jeep Cherokee and they said, do you want to drive it? I was like, this is, this is the dream car to drive, of course. They're like, well, it is, a, it, is, it is a stick shift. I'm like, this will be fine. And then I'm in the middle of a junction trying to get this thing to move so that we don't collide with somebody and like, like grinding the gears. And there's like smoke coming out of the back and they say, should we change drivers? Yeah, we should. <laughs> so that's what it felt like when people were suddenly going back into the office was a sense of, I now don't actually have that skill of interacting with people, being around other people as much as I used to. And even now I know that people who were, were very sociable before the pandemic are still sort of reluctant to leave the house as much as they used to. And so to come back to your question about what would I do to help people in a great big company. I think, you know, working with leaders around fundamental communication skills is critical, but it's not the way that business used to be. Business used to be like having taught this for a couple of decades, I can tell you like 15 years ago, companies were coming for us saying, could you teach us public speaking? We go, sure. Then it went from public speaking to presentation skills. Mm -hmm. Then it went from, okay, we're now long, no longer sort of using slides. We just want like meeting skills, like one to many meeting skills. And then more recently, they've said, okay, now what we need is more like conflict resolution skills and, and how to connect with one person really well, even if they're just online. And so the, the, the move from communication skills, the need of it has gone much more down to that one-to-one -one level. And so the, the skill that co the companies really need to be focusing on is how effective are your leaders at engaging one-to-one -one with the people immediately around them? And then how effective is that next level in, in interacting with their strong relationships one to one around them? So it's like sort of layers of the onion going outwards that it's very strong and it all holds together because each layer is strongly connected with the one uh, outside of it. And so that's the piece that I would really encourage leaders to get really powerful at not getting better at speaking at the company conference, although that's good and a very important skill and still necessary today. 
But I see some people who are good at that. And then on the day to day, you know, they manage to do that once a year. And on the day to day, it's not as effective. And so when they get on stage, they're not having as much of an impact because people think, yeah, but I just don't feel connected with you in general in what I see of you day to day. So that is the fundamental skill that I think everybody who gets to a leadership position, it, it should be part of their growth, part of their personal development, part of their package, if you like, that they will have powerful communication skills given to them such that they are able to influence on a day-to-day -day pedestrian level uh, to make sure that the, that the organization is going to move in the right direction. Hmm. I would totally agree with that, Richard. Um, hmm. Now, what would you tell an introvert? Let's say that this introvert is a manager in an organization who is saying, who is silently saying, I cannot be part of this. He's listening to what you say. Uh, he's part of the Fortune 500 company, maybe. And, and he say, no, I, I cannot, I'm an introvert. How can mm. you move him from that state to the next level? Yeah, great question. So I get this a lot uh, from people where like, they'll see me speaking on a podcast or, or at an event or doing a workshop. And they'll say, well, it's all very well for you, Richard, but I'm an introvert and this has never been easy for me and i'll say to them okay well i got news for you uh, like when i was a child i was incredibly shy like when, when new people came to the house i was the kind of child that hid behind my parents legs mm. i'm e exceptionally introvert so there's a big spectrum between introvert and extrovert and uh, I, i've done this multiple times all the different sort of tests you can get for if you're introvert extrovert or ambivert sort of somewhere in the middle and i'm as high a level introvert as you can get on the scores so much so that i once did this i did like a um we, you did like a personality profile before you went to an event and then you show up at the workshop and they give you your results and i was there and people were getting their results handed out and i hadn't been get, given mine and this guy at the front he said so just so you know what you're looking at with your results here's one and somebody who gets these kind of results, look at how much an introvert this person is. He would never show up to an event like this. And I said, I think you're holding my paper. That's mine. He said, no, 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 no. This person would never come. I said, it's got my name on it. He was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so he gave it to me. So, you know, introvert, and just so that people have the definition the same as I do, introvert means that you get your energy, you restore your energy by being alone. And extroverts uh, build their energy by being with others. Uh, my wife is very much an extrovert. I'm very much an introvert. So it's it's not that introverts can't be effective communicators. In many cases, I actually see them be more effective uh, as communicators because they they really love when when they can get a strategy around communication, then they they find it easier to follow it, e easier to um, to engage with that kind of journey in a conversation. Whereas extroverts find that it's like containing the energy of that conversation into more of a, or of a flow. It can be a harder process for them, but e either way, everybody can do it. So I'd say just rest assured as an introvert, you can do it. What you might do and what I certainly do is you might need more time before the meeting and after the meeting to process what's happening. So I certainly, before every meeting, I want to have as much information as I can about what's going to happen. So I can think through what I, uh, how I react to it, how I resonate with that information. I then go into the situation. And if there's a critical decision that needs to be made, I say to people, thank you for sharing all the information. I'll get back to you in the next hour with a decision and I allow myself to go away and recharge my energy while I think about the key decision and then give it. And, and you know, people around me, my, my clients, my team, they respect the fact that as a, a high level introvert, that's how I make my best decisions. Um, and the other piece that I would say in there that is, that is key is to make sure that you have your intention outwards when you're in a situation, because so many people can get themselves lost in their internal dialogue when they're in a meeting. And it's critical that you have that switched off and you're totally focused outwards. And the way that we do this, and the reason I wrote my book um, called Lift Your Impact is around this intention of lift. If people often say, well, I get self-conscious in a meeting, like I'm not very good in those situations. I say, look, before you go in, you focus on yourself, you get yourself prepared. But in the meeting, you need to go in with the intention to lift the other person, such that by the time you leave that interaction, that person feels elevated in their spirit, away from a negative or a neutral state to a more elevated state based on your intention towards them. And to do that, they need to feel deeply listened to, deeply heard, connected with you. You need to be there pr present with them, listening to them. And you can listen with, to people in different levels. You can listen not just to their words, but you can think, are their words emotional or factual? Are their words getting more negative or more positive? 
What is the tone that I'm hearing? What is the body language that's happening around this? You know, really see and feel that person. So you're so connected with them that you're not in your head. You're actually in their mind, in their heart and getting that empathy level going. And then you can come out of that situation and then think, okay, now I need my own time to think before I make a decision and move forwards. I, I especially want to highlight this part about that introverts need to recharge. So it yeah. is a little bit more of effort to have interactions, but in my specific case, for instance, I pay more attention. During, I, I have more intense time capturing a lot of information, but after a meeting, I need to be able to recharge. It's just mm -hmm. the, that's just the only difference. But I would say that it, the compensation is that the fact that we really pay attention to what is going on, very focused because it allows us not to be wasting energy because we want to get the job done correctly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the things that we also discussed uh, at the beginning is it was that one of the biggest challenges at work is the is the kind of the feeling of belonging, being part of uh, of this culture, of this environment. Uh, people are feeling lonely. <clears throat> Didn't help that we were working remotely. Uh, for certain people, it's quite fine to work remotely, but this feeling of not being part of the of something with a common purpose is is becoming quite heavy for for employees what is your yeah. best tip to overcome this challenge if you had to advise a manager how to create this feeling of belonging what would you tell him yeah so if you think about what a feeling of belonging means so think about if you get to the end of a long, hard day or a long, hard week, who do you think about calling in order just to share where you're at and maybe just unwind in a conversation with? The people that we end up calling or then spending time with or grabbing a drink with are people who see the world the way that we see the world because we want to share with them about you know what's happened and they'll resonate with this and they'll say yeah I would have felt that way and I would have reacted that way and, and we feel on a wavelength with them we feel a connection with them because they see the world the way that we see the world now when, when you come into an organization if it just has KPIs that are numbers based then the human brain just gets disengaged with that. Yeah, sure, we have a logical part of our mind, but we have the survival mind, the emotional mind as well. And so we, we, we will gradually get numb to the ideas of, uh, of numbers on a spreadsheet. Instead, we need a sense of, you know, why are we here and what, what is that shared sense of purpose that we have? And I think Simon Sinek did a great job of, you know, talking about this, where he said, effective organizations, they say, this is what we believe the world should be like. This is why we exist, because we want the world to be like that in the future. Beyond the KPIs, beyond the profitability and you know doing things for the shareholders, we believe the world should look like this. And what happens when you do that is that people who come to that organization know that they have a shared sense of purpose. They have shared values, a shared way of seeing the world because they also want to see the world end up like this. And so they're committed towards that path, towards that journey. And so it's down to leaders in an organization to articulate that piece as well. And I heard this said uh, brilliantly recently, and I forget the guy's name, but he said it so well. I'm trying to think if I can see his name just over here. Uh, he said, he said that you cannot get a million dollar team with a two dollar why. And what he meant by that is that if you, the reason you exist is to give people a nice salary and pension, like that's fine, but so many organizations do that. If you've got a million dollar why or a million dollar purpose, if you like, and take it away from, from financial terms, if you've got an extraordinary vision of the future of, we believe that it's possible for the world to be better in this way. And we're determined, as Apple once said, uh, I think as Steve Jobs once said, we're determined to make a positive dent in the universe over here, because we believe that this should happen for, for all these people then suddenly people get drawn in because they think I've actually got a reason to exist. I've got a reason to get up in the morning, not just to give us an incremental 7.45% increase in profitability, but I'm actually here because at the end of my working career, the world will be slightly better because of what I did. Uh, and so articulating that in the team meeting, speaking about that in the conference, in your town halls, in your employee reviews, uh, when you're changing culture, that's the piece where people go, I know why I'm here and I know what role I play in creating that legacy. So, you know, that, that's something that was done 
incredibly well. I think uh, NASA were, were great at doing this. I'm going to like uh, make a poor job of this story and people can go and look it up. But I, I believe what happened, it was one of the presidents back in the day was going through sort of looking at what NASA was doing and uh, came across a janitor who's just sort of cleaning up. And the president said, hey, um, you know, what, what's, uh, what's your job? And he said, I'm helping put a guy on the moon. Uh, and that's how deeply embedded that sense of purpose was that it's not I'm just a janitor. I'm helping us do something bigger. And I know this is my role in doing that big thing. So the more you can talk about that and articulate that, the better. And one last thing I'll say on that is that you know, part of how I, I help my team do that and how I do that with my clients as well is that I so often talk about the purpose, which is the story that you wanted to dig into me uh, with at the beginning of this podcast. It was, Richard, why do you do what you do? And I continually tell that to clients. I continually, continually tell that to teams where I say, when I was 18, I was driven by a mission to find my voice and help other people have a voice. So I went and worked with these monks for nothing in the middle of nowhere in the foothills of the Himalayas to help them have a voice because they were struggling. They needed money to survive, to exist in, in their culture. And so I was there doing that and I'm still doing that. And clients, I cannot even tell you the number of clients who have said, Part of the reason they hired me is they like the story about the monks. They're like, we know why you do what you do. You're on a mission. Other people are just trying to sell, you know, communication skills training, but you're on a mission. So having that deeply embedded in the story of why you do what you do at your business is critical. Richard, I, I, I think you you are just stealing a little bit of the, the stories of some other personal development uh, gurus, the one in Canada and the one in India. There is two yeah. guys who lived in, with the monks. And now we have Richard from UK living with the monks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something that is quite interesting and quite powerful is that about this sense of purpose is that it is a, it's kind of a ritual that leaders should, should develop. Like you cannot have it just on your website as part of your, this is why we exist you have to repeat it constantly. And this is really how you make that the, the gang is holding together behind the uh, behind the ultimate goal, the, 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 uh, the ultimate purpose of, of the organization. If there is mm -hmm. no repetition, reinforcement in many of the interactions that you have with the team, with your team and with even with other teams, then nothing is going to happen. It cannot be just, we crafted a beautiful sentence that is our purpose and we put it on the website that will not have any impact. Richard, yeah, yeah. it was really, really nice to spend time with you. I, 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 want to, I want to ask you, so how can people reach you out if they have questions, if they want to learn a little bit more about, uh, about how to better communicate, how to better storytell, uh, how to make change and impact in organizations? How can they reach you out? Great. Yeah, thank you. And th thanks for having me on the show as well. So th the best advice I have for people if they want to follow up after this, uh, I have, of course, got this new book that I mentioned earlier coming out. This is the best of the best of what I've learned in the last 23 years, Lift Your Impact. I put so much into there. It feels like it's sort of three books in one, giving people a lot of stuff there. So you can go and find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, you know, all good book places uh, have this now available. People can also uh, follow up with information on that in liftyourimpact.com. And uh, importantly, if you want to work with my team on communication skills, it is ukbodytalk.com. Uh, we work with people all the way around the world uh, to help them take their communication to the next level. So ukbodytalk.com. Amazing, Richard. I'm going to be putting all of these links below this, uh, this podcast. Thank you very much for your time, Richard. It was really lovely and inspiring to spend time with you. Great. Thanks so much.